Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, as we count down to Halloween, we are going to take a look at the tale of the first Welsh Jack O'Lantern. Because nothing encapsulates the spirit of Halloween, or Norse Kalangaev, as we call it in Wales, like the flickering face of a finely carved Jack O'Lantern. Now, before we begin our tale, we should take a quick look at the history of the Jack O'Lantern in Wales, because Nowadays, I think most people in the world, when you say Jack O'Lantern, are going to think of those wonderful big American orange pumpkins. But long before those sinister looking fruit became synonymous with Halloween, and yes, a pumpkin is a fruit, I've been corrected on that in the past, but long before the pumpkin became associated with Halloween, if we go way back through the mists of time, their origin can be traced back to the root vegetables of the Celtic nations of Britain and Ireland. The Gaelic people of Scotland and Ireland would traditionally cut up a turnip with which to repel evil spirits on October the 31st. And in Wales, while we also used turnips, it was the more readily available swede, which was usually hacked up into a menacing gaze for the spookiest night of the year. The night which marked the end of the harvest and the start of the winter. And when the veil between Anun, the other world in Welsh mythology, and ours was at its thinnest. But that's not the only difference between the Welsh jack-o'-lantern and the modern-day pumpkin. More than just one of them being a vegetable and the other one being a fruit, the jack-o'-lantern, or jack Erlanton, to give it its Welsh language name, the Jack Erlanton wasn't only an inanimate object. It wasn't just decoration. There were tales, there were reports that the Jack Erlanton had a mind of its own and people really did encounter it in the wild. In fact, it was seen as a form of death omen, like a corpse candle floating in the sky, leading people astray. And as regular listeners will know, last Halloween I dedicated an entire episode looking at one case in particular from near Pontypridd, where a newspaper in 1898 reported that an extraordinary moving light was causing considerable alarm in the nearby woods and one man in particular was happy to escape with his life after encountering this Jack Erlanton. And if you did miss that one, that was on episode 19. If you did want to go back and check that out, because this year we are going to look at the Jack Erlanton from a different angle. Instead of looking at these cases in the press, we are going to look at a folktale which attempts to give an origin story to these lights. Now, these accounts I looked at last year were supposed to be real-life encounters with the jack-o'-lantern. The folktale I am going to tell you on this episode is almost certainly not a real-life account with a jack-o'-lantern, and maybe the truth lies somewhere in between. Maybe this folktale was inspired by the real-life experiences of people who had seen these things, or maybe their experiences were coloured by having known the folktale beforehand. So maybe the best thing to do would be to tell you this tale, and then you can decide for yourselves what is fact and what is fiction. 
Now, the version of this tale that I'll be referring to throughout this episode comes courtesy of an old favourite of mine on this podcast, and that is Jane Pugh, who published this tale in the 1980s. But of course, it's based on a story which is much, much older than the 1980s. And this tale, I think, will be very familiar in parts to those of you who know the much more famous Irish tale which explains the origins of the Jack O Lantern as it would be in Ireland, the O Lantern as opposed to Jack O. And the Irish tale shares so many similarities. There's the devil and there's lots of fighting with the devil. I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence. I would say the Welsh version has been heavily influenced by the Irish version. But nevertheless, there are some nice Welsh twists to this tale which are not in the other version, such as the fact that our central character is an old man called Sean David, who we are told is famous throughout Wales for arguing with Satan, and most of the time Satan seemed to enjoy being at loggerheads with him. And what I should do quickly is to put Satan into some kind of context here, because going back in time, the idea that normal people could argue with Satan was a popular theme in many of the old tales from Wales. The Welsh people, and it was usually the wily old Welsh women, you you don't mess with wily old Welsh women, but they usually get the better of the devil by tricking him. They do this by beating him at cards or trying to offer him a better deal than the deal he's offering them. But whatever it might be, instead of Satan, instead of the devil being some terrifying creature from hell like he's portrayed in Renaissance paintings, instead, in Wales, the devil was more of a a 1960s Batman villain or a Scooby-Doo villain who runs around scaring people for a while, but eventually gets outwitted, usually by the old Welsh women, and unmasked and sent to jail, or in in his case, sent back to hell with a puff of fire and the smell of brimstone in his wake. But anyway, that's enough background info and putting things into context. Let us crack on with this tale. And to begin at the beginning, Sean lived in a tiny cottage near Pentir Bangor in Gwynedd, in the north of Wales, and he is believed to have been more than 80 years old at the time of this tale. But nevertheless, he was hale and hearty and full of health. The locals loved talking about all the times he had outwitted the devil. It was something he did on a regular basis by the sounds of it, but... There was one tale in particular they loved telling, and that concerned the first Welsh jack-o'-lantern. And this is a tale which involved an almighty tussle with Satan. And while people loved sharing stories about Sean, this particular tussle did not endear him to the inhabitants of a tiny village high up on the Sachnant Pass near Conoy called Doigavalchi. Now, our tale starts one autumn morning when Sean, who worked as a farm labourer for hire, was extra busy with the harvest. He helped out at various farms to make ends meet, and he was on his way to a farm in Llanvair Vechan, which is in the shadow of part of the Sachnant Pass. And he was in a good mood at the time, whistling as he went, and hoping that the farmer would offer him a mug of home-brewed ale before he started work. Those were the days, the good old days, when your employer gave you beer for breakfast before you started work. Maybe that's how he lived to a ripe old age and was hearty and healthy. But he was carrying at the time a very heavy flail, which he used for threshing corn, when suddenly he met someone blocking his path. It was somebody carrying a large sack slung over their shoulder 
and it was none other than his old sparring partner, Satan. And to quote Jane, and any conversation which does take place between Sean and the devil on this episode is courtesy of Jane's text. And to quote, he says, Hello, you old devil. What have you got in that sack? Something you have stolen, I will be bound. So right off the bat, he's being cheeky and upfront with the devil. And he was wrong. In fact, it wasn't something he had stolen. But inside that bag was, to quote, two little devils. What we might call two little demons now, two little creatures of hell, who were, we are told, in training for a satanic career. So two little ones the devil was carrying around and presumably showing them the ways of acting like a devil, and they popped their heads out of the sack for a look, which caused Sean to pass several uncomplimentary remarks, which is a polite way of saying he he might have cursed a little bit, he might have used some swear words, and he wasn't too polite, and he wasn't too nice about them. Now, Satan, as you might expect, wasn't too happy with the insults, and it all kicked off. And to quote, Sean became so angry, he started beating Satan with that heavy flail he was carrying to use on the corn he was now using on Satan. Like I said, Satan in these old tales isn't anything like the creature we more often think of him. Now, as a result, the two demons in the bag on the devil's shoulder became frightened, which isn't very devil-like or demon-like, so clearly they need their training, but they became frightened. They hopped out of that sack, and then they flew away to the village of Doigavalchi, and unfortunately for the village of Doigavalchi, they were seen by some local people flying in that direction who assumed that Doigavalchi must, as a result, be a wicked place if young demons wanted to go there. And this rumour spread that it was a place to be avoided, and it resulted in some fisticuffs. In the taverns, there was some barroom brawls afterwards because there were people defending and there were people deriding Doigavalchi. Presumably the people living there were defending it saying no we are not wicked. The people who didn't live there say yes you are and as a result there was fighting that was even fiercer than the epic fight between Sean and Satan themselves. So as mentioned at the start this is why Sean did not endear himself to the people of that little village. Anyway, time moved on. People returned to their lives. Maybe they stopped gossiping about the place. And many months later, Sean and Satan crossed paths once more, by which time they had both calmed down and we are told that all animosity had been forgotten and they chatted amiably. Now, on this occasion, Sean was carrying a big blunderbuss, as you do. A blunderbuss is one of those old-fashioned guns which are associated with pirates and steampunk and things nowadays, Warhammer characters, and with which he was hoping to shoot a deer. And to quote, Satan asked him, what is that? To which Sean replied, or lied, or both, only my old pipe, Satan. I was just trying to find a shady spot where I can have a puff at some oak leaves. To which Satan replied, Give me a smoke too. I have never had one before. Which I find a little bit hard to believe. You would think if there is one person in the universe who has smoked a crafty cigarette at some point, if not great big diabolical cigars, it would be the devil himself, but apparently he had never smoked. And so Sean decided he would make a joke out of it, replying, Well, from what I have seen and heard, you have smoked a great deal in anger, he said, 
laughing loudly at his own wit. Although I doubt anyone else is going to be laughing loudly at this joke. Maybe, maybe you had to be there. Maybe it was funnier back in the day. But he said, I have heard you have smoked a great deal in anger. Sean laughed. Satan did not. He kept his cool and replied, I shall ignore that remark. Just hand that pipe over and tell me what I must do. So Sean hands him the blunderbuss, which he is calling the pipe. And I'm sure you can see where this is going. It feels like a Looney Tunes cartoon sketch or something. But Sean says, right, you are welcome. I am sure I have filled it. Mind you put the right end in your mouth. So he's telling Satan to make sure he puts the right end of the blunderbuss, the right end of the gun into his mouth. And whatever you do, please don't try this at home. But Satan put the barrel of the blunderbuss, if it's called a barrel on a blunderbuss, I assume so. He put the barrel into his mouth, pulled back the hammer and bang. By all accounts, it was the loudest bang ever heard in that part of North Wales. And to quote, the surrounding cliffs seemed to vibrate and seabirds screamed and wheeled about in terror. It was a long time before the echo of the bang died away. So just to, to, to recap quickly, in case that was all a bit too bonkers for you, he's carrying his gun. He's tricked Satan into thinking that gun is a pipe. Satan has put the gun into his mouth thinking he's going to smoke a pipe, but instead he has pulled the trigger and blasted his own head and is not amused, we are told. He was snarling like a beast. And he said to Sean, your pipe is foul like you, David. And with that, he transformed into what is described as his satanic guys so maybe that terrifying devil is in there somewhere he just chooses not to show it when he's walking the earth and this satanic form had a fiery tail with great black wings with which he could fly away leaving the stench of brimstone in his wake once more as for sean he also carried on his way on foot not on wings convinced he would not be seeing the devil again for a good few months. But it was a bit longer than that. Two years went by without any sign of him, so maybe the trick with the pipe had pushed him a little bit too far. And truth be told, Sean was actually starting to miss his old sparring partner, because for all the fighting and joking and leg pulling, the two of them had a healthy respect for each other. But after waiting for more than two years, then one day, there came a loud knock at the door, which allowed me to use that lovely sound effect. And when Sean answered the door, he found himself face to face with, to quote, a well-dressed dandy of the Georgian period who was wearing beautiful rings on the fingers of both hands. Who could this possibly be? Who could be there dressed up as a dandy Georgian person on his doorstep? Was it adamant or could it possibly be the devil in disguise? Now, Sean was not easily fooled and he said, fine gentleman or not, I know you, Satan. What do you want? To which the gentleman replied, I am here for your own good, Sean. Let me come inside your pigsty. And with that, Sean was about to slam the door in his face when he added quickly, sorry, I did not mean to be rude. And Sean, not too warmly, said, come in. Inside the home where Sean kept a close eye on Satan at all times, the devil said, let bygones be bygones and listen to what I have to say. To which Sean replied, go on, 
Say it and go, because I am busy. And Satan said, Sean, my old friend, I am here for something you will not need very long. Now, anyone familiar with old tales involving Satan asking for something know that if there's one thing, the only thing he's ever really after, it's your soul. And Sean knows this full well, but he pretends not to. He pretends to assume that he must mean his home. To which Sean says, how do you know how long I want this cottage for? It is my only home. Where would a poor old man like me get an other one, even if this one is nearly falling down? To which Satan stops being so cryptic and spells it out. He says, Sean, I want your soul. And with that, Sean got ready to give him another thrashing. But Satan quickly added, in exchange, I will give you a brand new cottage, a much longer lease of life, and the promise not to take your soul ever if you are clutching anything when I call to collect it. And with that, Sean, with no hesitation, was sold. He said, it sounds reasonable, but it must be a cottage with a garden already planted with mature fruit trees. And then a few seconds later, Sean found himself inside a fancy new cottage, and there, outside the window, he could see a well-stocked garden and a small orchard. It was perfect. And Sean lived a long, happy life there, only leaving it occasionally to visit some of the old farms and do a little threshing, and eventually, Satan got a little bit impatient at just how long he was taken to die and he arrived there at the cottage looking ready for business and he said time is up for you Sean Davith come on and quickly scooped him up in his giant satanic wings and flew out the window to quote up up he whirled into the sky and Sean yelled hold on Satan we have been friends for so many years. Surely you will grant me one last request. To which the devil snarled. What is it you want now? No crafty tricks, mind. And Sean's request was simple and seemingly harmless. He said, let me have just one more apple. A sweet one from my little orchard. No one has such a apples. Now, Satan knew this to be true because it was him who gave Sean this wonderful garden full of everything his heart could desire. And so, when Satan offered to fetch one, Sean said, oh no, that will not do. I want the pleasure of picking my last apple on earth. To which Satan replied, a nuisance to me to the very last, Sean David. I must be mad to want you in hell. Nevertheless, they lowered down from the clouds and hovered above a specific tree in Sean's orchard, with Sean shouting, lower, lower, and he reached out and plucked an apple from the tree, and turning to Satan, he said, remember our bargain, evil one. He now had an object in his hand, and he could not be taken to hell. To which the devil replied, there is no place in hell for you, old crafty one, as in no time you would take over from me, and flew away, leaving Sean dangling from a tree. Now, luckily for Sean, despite his age, he was able to make it down from that tree unharmed, and he lived happily ever after, in that cottage until the ripe old age of 120 when he died peacefully and weary of life and content 
in the knowledge that he would never go to hell because the devil had rejected him. Sadly, when he reached St. Peter at the gates to heaven, he would not let him in either. He was not good enough for heaven. This is the man who had, in a strange way, been friends or at least acquaintances with Satan. There was no chance of him getting into heaven. And so, to quote Jane, poor old Sean David, not acceptable to heaven or to hell. What was he to do? Where would he go? He solved the problem by becoming the first Welsh Jack O'Lantern. He took on the form of a yellowish light, which on dark nights bobbed along in front of travellers, almost invariably leading them to their destruction in the Welsh marshes. Sean David, who had so often got the better of the devil, was doomed for all eternity to lead members of the human race to their death in a horrible manner. And while this tale is almost certainly a work of fiction, people have reported being led astray by such lights on cold, dark October nights. And for one such example, you can go back and check out episode 19 for last year's Jack-O-Lantern episode. And so ends this year's Jack-O-Lantern episode. And if you enjoyed it and you don't want to miss any of the other Halloween specials coming up and you haven't already, then please consider hitting the subscribe button. And if you really enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, you can now treat me to a coffee via my website. And I do love coffee, black, no sugar, or maybe just quickly leave a nice review or five stars or thumbs up or whatever the option is on whatever platform you are consuming this on. And as well as a podcast, if you'd like more ghosts and folklore in the lead up to Halloween or any time of the year, you can follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram. And I've also published a number of books on similar weird and wonderful subjects, including the most recent one, Paranormal Whales, which are available from all good bookshops online and off. All of which just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian am Rando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast, beaming to you from Wales to the world. Until next time, Happy Halloween, Norse Kalangayev Happis, and no star. <laughs>